So we're continuing on in our series called Blind Faith, and this is number seven in the series, and the whole idea behind the series was to challenge the assumption that people think about us Christians, which is they just have blind faith. They don't know really what they're doing. They're just going on some kind of emotional experience or teachings from their parents or whatever leads to them to say something about blind faith. And I want to challenge that assumption, and I think we have done so effectively over the last six weeks, and this is the seventh week in that. And uh, I'm hoping that you have been blessed by this as well, because you are going to be confronted with these uh, ideas that we've been talking about over the last few weeks. Uh, today's message is on the subject of religion and the gospel. Many of you uh, know people who are probably really moral people. They're just good folks, right? But they don't go to church. Uh, they don't have a relationship with God or that they're trying to find that relationship within another religious system. I want to talk to you today about the people that are even in our churches and in our pews, and I would say in a lot of churches, who like Jesus, they like the religious kind of system, and maybe they were even brought up in it, and are living it just because it seems like the right thing to do, rather than actually having an experience of faith and a Holy Spirit moment of when God gets a hold of them and speaks to them in their heart and lives out this relationship now and then live out a relationship with Him. You know, the Bible teaches us that our main problem is sin, right? Nobody wants to talk about sin, but we've talked about it in the last few weeks. Our main problem is sin. And a lot of other folks will actually recognize that they have a problem, that they don't measure up. I think that's the best way to describe sin to someone outside the church, that you may feel inside like you don't measure up. Anyone felt like they don't measure up? If all of you don't put up your hand, at least at this point, I mean, I'd be calling some of you to a class about confessing your sins, maybe, somewhere, okay? I think all, every one of us felt at some point like we don't measure up. We don't measure up to the expectations at work. We don't feel like we, we measure up to the expectations of our government. We don't feel like we measure up again to the expectations of our spouse, or, or maybe it's the, our own expectations of ourselves. I set goals for myself, and I, I realize very easily that I can say, I didn't follow through on all that. I didn't actually do everything I said I was going to do. That's the best way that I can think of to describe sin for someone who doesn't go to church. So when you're talking to someone about this idea of faith and religion, ask them the question, you ever felt like you just don't measure up, that you're not good enough? When you feel that way, that's a standard which you have imposed or which somebody else has imposed, and when you don't measure up, that's like what sin is. The Bible teaches us that sin is our main problem. But there's a very profound difference between how the other world religions, or any religion for that matter, talks about how to deal with sin. Literally, and I'm not telling you a lie for this, this has been researched over and over again, every single other religion, major or minor, has a person or a group of people that teaches you about how you can get to the place of whatever their version of salvation is. It's a teaching and a leading philosophy where they say, I will lead you to the truth. I will lead you to the salvation that you need. And if you just do these things, you will receive whatever that salvation is. Did you know Christianity is the only religion, the only one, where God himself says, it's not about following the rules. It's about believing that I I'm the way. Jesus is the way. It's as simple as that. And yet, it's a profound and fundamental difference. Well, somebody would say outside the church, well, you know, why, why can't we just go to another religion and deal with the sin problem that I have, right? Don't they deal with the sin problem? Yes. But it's a works righteousness. That's a very churchy word that basically means you got to earn it. And haven't you had enough of feeling like you don't measure up? That it's not good enough? 
That's one of the problems of the other religious systems is that you never know. You never know whether you measure up. And one of the problems with many in the church who have not accepted Jesus as their Savior is that they have put a religious system in a place to try and try and try to get it right. When all along, Jesus says, just accept me as the way to salvation. It's as simple as that. Maybe you've had the experience where somebody came up to you and you had a moment of faith, a faith discovery, and you thought to yourself, I'm not good enough. I've done far too many bad things in my life. And that person, I hope that they were wise enough to say, it's not about you. It's about what he has done for you. That's the gospel. Have any of you read the book, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Some of you probably watched the, the movies, the old movies about this. This is really, truly a fantastic story. If you ever get a chance and you're okay with a little bit of old English, 1800s English, uh, not King James English, but you know, a little bit older English, it is a fantastic story. It's a story of a man named Dr. Jekyll who struggles with the evil in his heart. And he knows that the evil person in him is actually keeping him from doing a lot of good. <laughs> as soon as I read that, I went, uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. Anyone else like, uh-huh? There's the evil in us that keeps us from doing the good that we want to do, right? I want to do good, but then that evil in me keeps me from doing it, and I don't. And so Dr. Jekyll's solution was to come up with a potion that he could drink to separate out the evil uh, Dr. Edward Hyde. Dr. Jekyll and Dr. Hyde. And what he did was, is that when he took this potion, he turned himself literally into the evil person, Dr. Hyde. And through that potion, that evil person did extraordinary evil. And he was so shocked by the extent to which Dr. Hyde would go to conduct himself with evil. I want to read to you a quote from the book. He says, I knew myself at the first breath of this new life to be more... He's now transformed into doctor, or to, to hide, okay, the evil part of him. I knew myself at the first breath of this new life to be more wicked, tenfold more wicked, sold a slave to my original sin. And the thought in that moment braced and delighted me like wine. Every act and thought that I had was centered on myself. Now, Edward Hyde thinks about himself and his own desires, and he doesn't care the slightest who he hurts or who he takes advantage of in order to gratify his own evil desires. Have you ever struggled with this? I'm like, uh-huh. Have you ever gotten to the point where you're thinking, I just want to do the evil thing? I'd rather do the evil thing. Stevenson, the, uh, the author, Robert Louis Stevenson, the author, is saying that even the best of people hide from themselves from within. We have an enormous capacity for egotism, self-absorption, and regard for our own interests over those of the others. Self-aggrandizement, which is basically making ourselves more powerful, wealthy, and important, and aggressively ruthless than anyone else, is probably the foundation for all of the evil in the world. When you think so highly of yourself that you are unrestricted by the good, all of the evil that is experienced in the world comes from that. Violence, crime, warfare, all of it at its heart, in most cases, is this disintegration that happens. We hide from ourselves, from our self-centered capacity for acts of evil. But sometimes that evil comes out, doesn't it? Sometimes it slips out. 
kind of like in the story of Dr. Jekyll and Dr. Hyde. And we're ashamed. We're shocked at some of the things that we might actually say or do. Once Dr. Jekyll realizes how bad he really is, he decides to clamp down and he stops taking the potion. He says, this is far too evil. I can't do this anymore. And he stops taking the potion. And he decides to get religion. And so he starts doing all kinds of things that are altruistic and uh, charitable. And he uh, helps the poor and he helps the needy. And he tries to do everything that is good. And one day he's sitting on the bench in the park thinking about all the good that he's been doing and how much of a better man he is now than he was. And then he says, and I'm going to read this to you again, I resolve in my future conduct to redeem the past. And I can say with honesty that my resolve was fruitful to some good. You know how earnestly in the last months of the last year I have labored to relieve suffering. You know that much was done for others. But as I smiled, comparing myself with other men, comparing my active goodwill with the lazy cruelty and others' neglect. At the very moment, that vain, glorious thought, a qualm came over me, a horrid nausea, and the most deadful, dreadful shuddering. I looked down, and I once more was Edward Hyde. For the first time, Jekyll becomes Edward Hyde without the use of the potion. But it's the good Dr. Jekyll. It's the good Jekyll that sits there and says, I've done all these good things. I am better than those other people. I didn't do all that evil. And it's in that moment when he looks down at himself and realizes that he is actually Edward Hyde. Like so many of us, Jekyll knows he's a sinner And so so he desperately tries to cover his sin with great piles of good works. Yet his effort to do actually shrivels his pride and his self-centeredness. And in the midst of it, it just aggravates everything. They lead him to superiority and self-righteousness, pride, and suddenly... Look, I am Edward Hyde. Jekyll becomes Hyde, not in spite of his goodness, but because of his goodness. See, sin and evil, we tend to think of these two things as the characterizations of of Hyde and Jekyll. Sin and evilness is breaking all the rules, right? But there's another side to sin, which is trying to keep all the rules. Being good, which leads to self-righteousness. I'm better than you. Being your own savior. I can do this on my own. Trusting in your own goodness rather than in Jesus for your standing with God. Trying to save yourself by actually following Jesus. I want to follow him because he's a good teacher and he's the one who's going to show the way. But I really, truly am the savior of my own soul. Believe it or not, this is a rejection of the gospel. It's a Christianized form of religion. It's a religion, not a relationship, as my wife so dearly told me this morning. It's possible to avoid Jesus as Savior by keeping all the rules, just as it is possible to avoid Jesus by breaking them. Let me say that again. It is possible to avoid Jesus as Savior by keeping all the rules, just as it is possible when you break them. Both walk the same pathway. Because both are sinful self-salvations. Through good works, through doing great things, good morality, good behavior, filled with self-righteousness, 
But then comes, out of self-righteousness, cruelty and even bigotry. I think you've seen this before. People feel so good about themselves that they start looking down their noses at others who are not as good as them. And somehow, they have it as their mission to make them feel like they are less than. They want to make sure that other people know that unless you do as I do, you will never truly reach salvation. So, so many of you, I can see it in your eyes. You know this person. Maybe you were that person at one point. See, because there's a lot of people in the pews in a lot of churches, maybe even some here, who without knowing it, have never had a real experience, a spiritual experience of being invited into a relationship with Jesus and giving of themselves. I want to read to you a parable from Luke chapter 15. You all know what I'm going to read to you, right? It's the parable of the prodigal son. But Jesus never titled it that way. It should have been titled The Two Sons. Listen, Luke 15, 11 to 32. To illustrate the point further, what point? What point was he making? He had a bunch of Pharisees standing around him, accusing him of helping people who were lost. And Jesus tells three parables, three stories, to help them come to understand that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost to find the lost coin, to go after the one lost sheep. And then he ends up the three stories with this one, which is about the prodigal. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. This is why I think that it should be titled the prodigal or the parable of the two sons. The younger son, and this is the first part of the story, right? The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. Now, you can imagine that there was a lot of conversation and emotion around this ask, right? I mean, the Bible just breezes over this because Jesus is setting up the story of the return. A few days later, pardon me, uh, father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, his younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all of his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, is that an understatement or what? Right? Right? Could you imagine the struggle that had to, he had to go through in order to get there? I don't know, maybe some of you have been there in that struggle, right? You know, Elisa, yeah. And it, and it was like hard. It was so hard because you fought against yourself to get to the place where you said, I have really screwed this up. And not only that, I have alienated everyone who wants to help me, who should help me. And also, and by alienating those people, I've broken so many relationships. It's so difficult. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am, dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. That story, that, that phrase, pardon me, that phrase that he was willing to rehearse in his mind to be able to share with his own father speaks to me of humility and a surrender. Right? A surrender to say, God, I can't do it on my own. My father can help me. So he returned, to his, returned home to his father. And here we get the second son is introduced into the story. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Sorry, not quite yet, in just a minute. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. 
And I, and I have to get you to enter your imagination for a moment, right? When did the father expect him home? He had no idea. There was no timeline. There's no indication that there was a letter sent saying, Dad, I'll be home on the 15th between 6 and 6.30. Let me read it to you again. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. I get the feeling that his father had been looking for him every single day, looking to the horizon, waiting for his son to come back. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. He didn't have to wait for the apology. He didn't have to berate his son first before he gave him a hug and a kiss. He just ran to his son and gave him a hug and a kiss and filled with love and compassion. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Some of you are like prodigals. You're worried about coming back to Jesus because you didn't think you were worthy, that you weren't good enough. And yet the father has been waiting, standing at a distance, looking at the horizon, watching for you, waiting for you to come running into his arms. His father said to the servants, verse 22, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf which we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost but now he's found. So the party began. Beautiful. Here's the second son. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants, what's going on? Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. And look at this. What does, he, what does it say? The older brother was angry. The older brother was angry. What is it about the older brother that made him angry? And he wouldn't even go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. And yet this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes and you celebrate by killing the fatted calf. Sounds like he had a good argument. I did everything right. I've done nothing wrong. I kept all the rules. I did as you asked me to. But where was the same love and compassion that the father had for the brother who was far off? Remember the father? While he was still a far way off, his father saw him coming filled with love and compassion. He wasn't there. Verse 31. His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by by me, and everything that I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. Beauty of this parable. If you're a prodigal, you have this hope that God is looking for you, waiting for you. And yet, for the older brother... The older brother who did everything right. You see, the difference between the two people is grace. The difference between the older brother and the younger brother is willingness to accept grace and to live out grace. The difference between the father and his two sons is his father was willing to extend grace to both. And one son received it, and the other said, I can do it myself. Religion operates on the principle, I obey, therefore I am accepted. 
But the operating principle of the gospel is I am accepted by God through what Christ has done. And that's why I want to obey. And then some people are thinking, well, that's just semantics. No, 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 no. It's a big deal. When you look at it from those two perspectives, it changes everything. If those two people sat next to each other in church, you would see that they both actually prayed, that they both gave money generously, and they are loyal and faithful to their family and to their church, and they probably live decent lives, and they could be sitting right next to each other in church. However, they do so out of two radically different motives. One is, I obey, so I'm accepted. And the other is, I'm accepted. That's why I obey. The primary difference is motivation. In religion, without relationship, we try to obey the divine standards, but it's usually out of fear, right? If I don't do it right, God's going to be angry with me. If I don't get it right, if I don't say it right, if I, if I screw up, God's not going to be happy with me, and I'm fearful of that, so I'm going to be good. In the gospel, the motivation is one of gratitude, of blessings that I've already received because of Christ. I can't can't do it. I can't make it. I can't do it on my own. And God says, I know you can't. And I accept you just the way you are. I know that you can't be making it perfect. I know that you screwed up. As a matter of fact, God looks at you and says, It's because you screwed up that I sent my son Jesus because I know that you can't get it right. I know that you can't always measure up. And it's through Jesus and his sacrifice, when we believe in that, that we we have grace. You know, another difference is that it's about our identity too. In a religious framework, you feel like you're living up to your chosen religious standards. If you're not living up to the chosen standards, then you're going to be filled with I don't know, self-loathing maybe. I'm never going to make it. I don't know what to do. I don't know why I'm never going to make it. I can't seem to figure it out. You're going to feel far more guilty in that situation. And it actually might lead to you know, thinking you're better off not knowing God at all. I'm so flawed. I don't know why. You know, Jesus you know, had to die for me. I'm just... But it's the gospel. The gospel says well, that's why I need Jesus. That's why I need the relationship. I'm valued, I'm loved in spite of myself, in spite of all the the stuff that I've done. And I can't feel superior to anybody. I can't look down my nose at someone. Even when I get it right long enough, I've, I've, been, I've received the grace of God, and by God's grace, I've, I've given myself to this idea of obeying his teachings and following him. Why? Because I love God, and I want to obey him, and he's given me such joy in my life, and I can no longer look down my nose at other people. I can't look at other cultures and say that you are less than my culture. I can't look at other groups of people and say that you are less than I. I can't even look at people who disagree with me and say that you are less than I. It's a powerful thing. There was a woman who uh, was going to church, and she said that she had gone to church growing up and had never before heard the difference in the explanation of what the difference was between the gospel and religion. She'd always heard that God accepts us only if we're good enough. And she said that this was a very new message to her, and it was scary. When the pastor asked her why she was scared, she replied, if I was saved by my good works, then there would be a limit to what God would ask of me or put me through. It'd be like paying taxes with rights. I would have done my duty, and now I would deserve a certain quality of life. But if I'm a sinner, saved by sheer grace then there's nothing that he can't ask of me. See, that woman could see immediately that her wonderful, beyond belief teaching of salvation by sheer grace actually had an edge to it. 
if she was a sinner saved by grace, she was more subject to the sovereign lordship of God. If God did all these things for her, she would not be her own. She would joyfully and gratefully belong to Jesus, who provided all of this for her at an infinite cost to himself. But when we submit ourselves to him and say, thank you, Jesus, he now may come to you and ask you to do what seems the impossible. He might actually ask you to forgive that person who has hurt you the worst. He might actually ask you to give up everything to serve him in some capacity. You know, from the outside, that might sound way too difficult. You might say, well, forget that. If you're standing on the outside, look again. But if you're in the inside, and you say to yourself, I, I cannot believe that all of those evil thoughts that I had in my head that I was thinking about just like 15 minutes ago when I was talking to you about it, all those evil things that you thought to yourself, there's some days when I just want to let it out. There's some times when I just want to do the evil that's in my mind. That God would forgive me for all those things. I can't believe that all of the things that I've done in my life, all of those terrible things that I've said to people, all of those things that have hurt someone that he forgives from the inside, that brings me such joy to know that I am completely forgiven, set free. Amen? Oh, praise Jesus. Lord, I'll do whatever you want, comes my reply at this moment. I think about Isaiah in the book of Isaiah chapter 6. He is struck by the fact that he is so sinful. And the angel of the Lord brings a, a coal from the altar of God where the sacrifices were made for the forgiveness of sins, right? It's a symbol. The angel pulls a coal from the fire. Like the sin that is cleansed is through fire. He brings it over and touches Isaiah's lips. And obviously this is in a dream, right? So he's not in, a, in pain. But he recognizes the forgiveness of sin. And God says, who can I send? And I imagine Isaiah going, pick me, please, pick me. <laughs> the gospel message will change you. See, if somebody asked me to marry them, like if I asked somebody to marry me, like if when I asked AJ to marry me, I'm not like, honey, I'm, I'm not asking anyone else to marry me, okay? But when I asked AJ to marry me, I didn't turn to her and say, oh, that's great, I'm in, and then do whatever I want. It doesn't work that way, does it? I love her. And because I love her, I'm actually willing to do what she asked me to do. Sometimes reluctantly, but, you know. She doesn't have to coerce me. When you say yes to Jesus, you say, I love you. And I'm willing to do what you ask me to do, even if it's hard. See, the founders of every major religion came as teachers, not as saviors. Jesus came essentially as our savior. And he was a great teacher too, mind you. Jesus says, I am the divine, come to you to do what you could not do for yourselves. The Christian message is that you are saved, not by our record of rights, nor by our record of wrongs, but by Christ's record, completely sinless. We are saved by grace. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, thank you for this message today. Lord, there are so many of us who have experienced an awakening of the Spirit of God in our lives. And then, over time, we've resorted to behaving right because it's expected of us. Father, there are some of us who have chosen 
to live a life where we don't really give a hoot either way about anyone else or ourselves. And then you came along and showed us what it truly means to be forgiven. Lord, for both people here this morning, would you allow us to feel your presence, to recognize and be grateful for all that you've done for us. And from that place, live a life of gratitude, of service, of humility. In Jesus' name, amen.